Michael Walsh's warrior stories to Stephanie Gutmann, who I found, again, when I was researching for this conference. She wrote a book, this is the perfect segue from Michael's talk, The Kinder, Gentler Military. And she's not for it, nor should we be. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie Gutmann. Um, well, Michael Walsh has basically explained why, why we're doomed. Um, because what I'm going to tell you about the U.S. military is not very good, though I am an optimist and I believe, like many things, this can be turned around. So my presentation is about, uh, based on my book, The Kinder, Gentler Military, which uh, was about the 30-year project to expunge and rebuke and minimize what was known as the warrior culture. People don't even talk about the warrior culture anymore. I think that they've so moved on. Um, I date the beginning of the great sort of war on the warrior culture from the early 90s. That's when I began, that's when I went out into the field to look at what was going on. But it was a period around 1994 when Congress looked around and uh, at that time we sort of thought we were at peace for forever. Um, the Soviet Union had been defeated and people looked out over their landscape and they really didn't see any big threats. And so Congress, and it's always Congress pulling the strings. It's always Congress changing the, pop, the policy. Um, turned to the U.S. military, a great, great captive population. And one of their favorite things to do in peacetime is sort of toggle with uh, social experimentation and uh, get back to sort of trying to create a nirvana with this population. And um, at the time, it was believed, women were only about 15% of the force at that point. Uh, social engineers in Congress were besotted with the idea of a 50-50 sex ratio. They really believed that that was achievable. Uh, they envisioned it all the way up the ranks and in every single military job, including the, all the combat jobs and including weird things like submarining. Um, and that, that was what they were shooting for. Um, so this experiment began, all kinds of uh, policy changes were made. Um, the first big one was to um, do away with single sex basic training in much of the army. Uh, infantry still trained men only, um, but vast amounts of the army were now going to train co-ed. And nobody else in the world does this, even Israel, which is very famous for its co-ed, gender-integrated military trains the sexes separately because it's recognized that our bodies are very, very different and that men get bored and uh, if they're not challenged and women get injured if they're trying to keep up with the men. So that was the point at which I entered this, this, this research would would go on to take me about five years and cost $100,000, which was a lot of money at the time, and um, take me all over the country and to Bahrain and on an aircraft carrier cruising the Persian Gulf and stuff. I was a very unlikely person to get into this sort of thing. I was your typical Upper West Side freelance writer. Um, I was writing for publications like Cosmopolitan and the New York Times style section. I didn't know the difference between a colonel and a corporal, which led to some very embarrassing moments uh, early in my reporting. Um, but anyway, there I was in 95, and I was leafing through uh, an issue of New York Magazine, and I came across 
a short news item. It was something about scientists, uh, it described scientists in a secluded lab in Natick, Massachusetts, and they were hard at work on a experiment to see if the average woman could become as physically strong as an average man. Now, in the news business, this is what you call a very sexy story because of all the James Bondian elements of secret lab and army and women and the men and all kinds of things. So a lot of publications were jumping on this story. A German newspaper had come out with a headline, um, U.S. Army builds female Rambos as U.S. Army is creating the bionic woman in a lab, pumping women up to man-sized proportions. I was only interested from the sort of male-female relations point of view, because at that point I still wasn't interested in military policy. So I tried to get permission to go up to Natick, or down to Natick, I guess, from New York, and, um, and report, see what was going on. Uh, they gave me the stiff arm. Uh, I was very persistent. Finally, they let me come up, um, but only when the project was, was on its last day and people were packing their lockers. Um, I found out that the experiment had involved uh, 40 civilian women, a very Average, I mean, not average in any sort of ideological way, not connected with the military, not particularly fit. They were waitresses, beauticians, bartenders, teachers. Um, one woman told me she'd signed up because it was cheaper than a health club, and she <laughs> hoped to be in really great shape when she finished the 16 weeks of, of strength training, 90 minutes a day. Actually, that doesn't seem like a lot, but anyway. Um, so later the reports were published and they were positive. Um, they, uh, the, the scientist, there was really only one guy running this, said 78% of the study population could now lift 100 pounds, up from 24%. They increased their speed of running with a rucksack by 33%. And the press, which is the MSM, which has basically played the role of cheerleader yeah. for women in combat and increasing women in the military, whatever, you know, the cost, just in terms of, you know, it's the right thing to do, um, responded approvingly with headlines like Army Study, Women Can Pull Weight in Combat, and G.I. Jill, Get Ready to Take Load Off G.I. Joe. But it had been a small study. And the scientist who had dreamed it up wanted to do a bigger study, so he applied for a grant. His next grant was turned down. He told me he thought his line of inquiry had fallen out of favor because, quote, a couple of key women in positions of power nixed the funding. At the highest level, they feel that we, Army scientists, in other words, should be doing more to lighten all jobs. I think that they feel that if we show that women can get stronger, the onus will be on women to get stronger, when in fact the job should be made easier. Now that was a very significant <laughs> quote because it basically was the template for the entire next 30 years and on into today, which was not, you know, we have this kind of good thing going. It's worked out pretty well for centuries. It's kind of the way everybody else in the world does it, you know, sort of male majority, male basically at the lead in combat roles. And we're going to follow that, and a certain amount of strength and fitness is required to, to do these jobs. It's non-negotiable. A lot of these jobs aren't going to go away, no matter how technological we get. Um, as we saw in Kosovo, as we saw in Iraq, where we fought door to door, well, at least in Iraq, um, this urban combat is not going away because asymmetrical set, uh, threats aren't going away. So basically, 
upper body strength and general aerobic fitness is going to stay very important for a very long time. But um, the push was, well, we want women. We want 50% women. And so we're going to we're going to get them, and we're going to change, if we have to change the entire force, the whole culture of the force, all the jobs, remake jobs, remake equipment, we're going to do it, because that's the most important thing. So in 1995, I went uh, over to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where that was one of the bases where they were doing co-ed training. It was pretty new. Um, and I found a very transformed military. I mean, nothing like one envisioned, one, nothing like one sees in the old-fashioned movies with boot camp and the crucible and yelling drill sergeants and sweating recruits. And it was totally different. It was more like a church picnic or kindergarten. Um, the famous obstacle course of movie after movie, like a full metal jacket, had been renamed the confidence course. <laughs> and the, 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 famous ob the, the famous wall, which recruits are always like, you know, getting hung up on the wall, um, had been lowered. And it had been turned into a team building exercise so you could get your buddies to like help you push you over and stuff because it was it was about team building and um, uh, the very, um, much the same thing was going on in the Navy um, there was a, a group of recruits were taken by bus out to Great Lakes <coughs> Naval Training Base and they used to play a movie for them saying something to the effect of, well, this is going to be very stressful for you. You're away from home, many for the first time, but it's okay to cry. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was pretty bad. And uh, when I would talk to young women, I'd say, so how do you, what do you like? How do you like it? And Generally, they would echo the sort of self-actualization stuff. The military at the time had transformed their recruiting uh, slogans. There were things like, uh, be all you can be, join the army, so be all you can be. Um, there was the famous army of one slogan from the army. It's just sort of just about you, you know, being the best you you can be. Um, so they would echo things like, oh, I'm feeling good about myself. I feel I can do anything I try to do. This has been a good experience. But the boys that I talked to, I'm calling them boys, they were 18, 19 years old, were, were, were disappointed. And um, they weren't getting the experience that they wanted, that they had been looking for, the crucible, the transformation, maybe strong father figures. Um, and so they were very bored. Okay, so I'm fast, fast forwarding to the present. Um, things are generally operating along the same lines. Commander's time is now taken up with tons and tons of DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff. They have the implicit bias stuff. Um, they have all that stuff. Another big obsession that started in the Obama years was um, a push to make transgender people feel comfortable. I guess there had been so much done with women that that almost became the wallpaper. That's like not an issue anymore. So the new job on the horizon was to make transgender people feel comfortable. You want a force that looks like America. Um, that's often repeated. So to that end, commanders nowadays uh, have something called Tier 3 Transgender Training. You can find the module online. And they learn things like what to say when a soldier wants to discuss, quote, his newly confirmed pregnancy. 
um, the module also addresses problems like what to do when a soldier, quote, who still has male genitalia exercises her right to shower with female soldiers. Um, the, the manual says, okay, you might have this problem. Soldier begins using female barracks bathroom, but because she did not undergo surgical change, she still has male genitalia. And the officer, commanding officer, is then to supposed to do kind of a struggle session with himself. It tells you to remind yourself that you may encounter individuals in barracks, bathrooms, I'm reading from the module, or shower facilities with physical differences of the opposite sex. All soldiers should be respectful of the privacy and modesty concerns of others. However, transgender soldiers are not required or expected to modify or adjust their behavior based on the fact that they do not match other soldiers. And in his book, Stand Down, which covers the Obama years, it kind of takes off from where I left off. I sort of left off at Bush. Um, the author, James Hassan, points out that this is a first, telling soldiers that you're not expected to modify or adjust your behavior is a, hi a historical first because the military is normally in the business of telling soldiers to modify or adjust their behavior all the time. That's basically what happens when you're in the military. You're being brought up to a certain standard. Um, it is the standard determined that is needed to, to do the job. Uh, it's about transformation. It's about soldierization. So, um, but the, the kind of um, the wokeness of the current military has been full of all kinds of stuff like that. In 2012, in order to better understand the problems pregnant soldiers may encounter during PT, the Army instituted an exercise which required non-commissioned officers, i.e. sergeants, uh, to take a uh, program called Pregnancy Postpartum Physical Exercise Leadership Course, during which the sort of grizzled sergeant types were required to wear a pregnancy simulator, which was comprised of fake breasts and what is called an empathy belly, a, a fake pregnant belly. Uh, yeah. So now I googled empathy belly, and apparently this is not a new thing. Apparently it's all over the internet. Apparently CEOs of you know groovy companies they do this on there. They wear them all the time on their you know bonding weekends and and such. This is this is something people do, but I, you know as applied to the military, I I think it, it there was I sensed a definite. A little bit of sadism in there um, by the powers that be requiring this. You know, just a little bit of you know needling of that dreaded warrior culture is the ha ha. You're a captive population, and we can make you do this. Um, it, catching another whiff of sadism in 2015, a number of ROTC programs on different campuses forced cadets, mainly male cadets, because that's, the population hasn't changed, it's still mainly male, to don red high heels and do something called walk a mile in her shoes, which meant they had to walk around the town in their camos, but with red high heels. And this is also something that has been big in the civilian population, but someone got the idea that, that it would be good in the military, too. In a couple of years ago, I uh, wrote an article about the newest uh, Army recruiting ad, which appalled all kinds of people because it was about as woke as you could be. It featured a young woman who was making the much much of the fact that she was 
um, the product of two mothers, and they were so groovy, and here are my two mothers, and I just love the military because it lets me be whoever I am. Um, and so it's been like 30 years of this stuff, and what I found out when I finished, by the time I finished this article, and I actually started looking at GEO data statistics about force composition, and I realized that since the time I'd written the book, when women were about 15% of the enlisted population, two years ago, that number was only 16.5%. So all of this had only just nudged the needle a tiny bit. And the key number was that women are 28% more likely than men to leave before completing a contract. So in other words, you may kind of get a few more in with all these you know, friendly stuff, but at the end of the day, they're 28% higher to, to leave, to say, okay, this is, this is not my thing. Um, and we are, in 2024, at a historic recruiting crisis. Only two of the services, the Space Force and the Marines, met their recruiting goals. Um, we're at an all-time low in terms of propensity to join the services, which is something the DOD polls a lot of. And. Um, one can only wonder why this is, and uh, I think it's kind of obvious that, you know, there have been 30 years of a sustained bludgeoning of the warrior culture, which was used to be the thing that attracted young men, and it's always going to be young men. I mean, the, the numbers show women just really don't want to join up. Um, the, and the force is still dependent on the male body. That's not going to change either. Um, and it's 30 years of sort of beating up on, on, on men, and young men are now looking around, and they're uh, seeing the endless parades of firings over sexual harassment charges, and um, uh, they're seeing all this stuff. And its recruiting has become a real problem. Um, but um, I think that I think that the armed forces are going to have to have a sort of Anheuser Busch moment. <laughs> I think that if if it could happen to Anheuser Busch, if they could just have that sharp shock where they just realize, okay, we've gone too far, we're losing our business. We've got to go back to our core constituency. Um, there might be a chance. Also, we need a new commander-in-chief. Okay. <laughs>